right, good evening, everybody. Go ahead and join me in standing. Turn in your hymnals 376. 376, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll sing all four verses. 376, a shelter in the time of storm. Starting on that first. The Lord's our rock, in him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. evening turn over to 209 209 as we continue singing till the storm passes by 209 till the storm passes by as we sing all three verses starting on that first in the dark of the midnight have i oft hid my face while the storm howls above me and there's no hiding place in the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by, till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. to try for there's no end of sorrow there's no hope by and by but i know thou art with me and tomorrow i'll rise where the storms never darken the skies till the storm passes over till the thunder Stand in 
thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore in that land where the tempest never comes. Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Amen. And one more this evening, 570 in your hymnals. 570, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. 570 in your hymnals as we sing all four verses. 570, faith is the victory. Encamped along the hills of life, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us, his love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that On every hand the foe we find Drawn up in dread array Let tents of ease be left behind And onward to the fray Salvation's helmet on each head With truth all gird about The earth shall tremble neath our tread And echo with our shout the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. On that last, to him that overcomes the world, white raiment shall we give. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then upward from the hills of light with singing please remain standing for the prayer let's pray dear heavenly father we come before you this night and lord once again we ask that you would meet with us that you would encourage us and strengthen us out of your word that you would teach us things that would help us to live each day for you in jesus name we pray amen you may be seated and um uh, just a couple things to uh, report. We have made some serious progress over at Union on the lights. Uh, the only problem was somebody ordered only 12 pieces of molding when we needed about 16. I'm not going to tell you who that was, but uh, we're kind of stuck until we get some more molding in, which should be here next week while I'm in Oklahoma City. Amen. And so uh, hopefully once I get back, be able to finish up this first section and uh, 
uh, get the lights installed and actually see what this is going to look like. So uh, please keep that in prayer if you would. And uh, we've had some success with the uh, May offering uh, for Heartland, was able to get a hold of, uh, uh, actually, Brother Copes came up with the idea. He said, why don't you have so-and-so from Indiana call so-and-so from Baltimore? And uh, it worked. And so uh, uh, we're just, uh, we're moving forward and uh, we're gonna be able to get very close to what we gave last year. Uh, Open Door Bible Baptist Church is doing exceptional. Uh, the extra offerings that have come in have put us to the highest level of giving that we've ever been able to do. And so we praise the Lord for that. And uh, I think I told you even Union has promised uh, to uh, participate in the offering and uh, uh, that was very good. And uh, people are giving. And of course, if you want to serve the Lord, if you want God to bless you, one of the ways, we don't give to get, not a slot machine. But when we allow God to work in our hearts to give, it opens a door for him to bless us. And so let's uh, keep all of those things in prayer. Next uh, Thursday night, I think I have this right. You're here and uh, pray for Brother Jason as he'll be going over and preaching at Union on Wednesday night. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be coming back Friday afternoon and uh, be here for Sunday and all those things uh, that are going on. Brother Shravi and I are going together, and so Lord willing, we'll be able to uh, enjoy uh, the time together and the meeting itself. So uh, with all that said, uh, let's have that last song get right into it. All right, join me in standing. Turn to 397. 397, trusting Jesus, simply trusting every day. Trusting Jesus, 397, as we sing all four verses this evening. Trusting Jesus. Simply trusting every day. Trusting through a storm. That is all. I'm 
that last. Trusting Him while life shall last. Trusting Him till earth be past. Till within the jasper wall. Trusting Jesus that is all. Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, and we are going to just backtrack a, a verse or so here, back to verse 7, pick up the context here, and uh, we have the commands, again, just a summary of how our faith ought to behave, how we ought to treat others, uh, that we ought to let brotherly love continue, that we ought to be pure in our moral uh, behavior, that our conversation ought to be without covetousness. And verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And uh, I forgot to tell you during the announcement time, uh, Brother uh, John Wilkerson, many of you will remember him from years gone by, was actually just traveling through New York City. And so I, I get a text from him this morning, would you mind if I stop by? And so he brought his son and uh, one of the young staff members from the church there in Indiana, where he is now, and he said, would you tell them the story of Open Door? And uh, so very quickly, and why do we do that? Uh, because of verse 6 here. So that we can say, the, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I mean, God has done some very special things. Amen. And I always love to see the shock and awe. No, that's not me tonight. Uh, 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 the, uh, my wife said, I finally joined the Charlie Horton Club. And uh, if you remember him, he was always, uh, I don't think he ever got through a service without his phone going off. And, uh, but uh, uh, back to our subject here, uh, the look on people's face when you just tell them the story of how God raised the money for the building and all the things that he did so that our little church can be here. And, uh, uh, and then we have all the stories of things that are going on at Union as well. Amen? And uh, I, I will tell you, God wants to give you stories to tell. Put yourself in a place where God can do something that only He can take credit for. And I tell you, He will do it every, every day time. And so with verse 7, we did cover this last week, but we're just going to touch on it again to keep things in the context. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which had not profited them that have been occupied therein. And so uh, we just want to again touch on this verse. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, 
because Jesus is the same, we should be the same. Do you realize, uh, how many of you remember that um, study that we did? Oh, this was several years ago on the King James Bible and its history. And I showed you the slides and all of those things. And we, we spent probably a better part of six months just going through the history uh, of our Bible. And the reason why I bring that up tonight is I, I do want to remind you that the greatest and most, uh, the greatest majority and the most grievous corruptions to our text occurred within the first hundred years of the Bible being completed. Uh, that's why some of these quote unquote oldest and best manuscripts aren't the oldest, and they aren't the best. Uh, the reason they're the oldest uh, existing manuscripts is because nobody used them. I was just looking at my Bible here as I was opening up uh, during the song service and put my bookmark in. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and James chapter 1 are loose in this Bible. Uh, it is wearing out. Uh, and uh, that's what happens when you use... A Bible. It wears out. And so we need to understand Jesus hasn't changed. His word hasn't changed. The idea that people would try to change God's word, try to change what we believe is nothing new. Jesus warned about it. Paul warned the Ephesian uh, the elders of the Ephesian church about this in the book of Acts. Uh, this is something that is going to happen, going to continue to happen until the ultimate corruption of truth is embodied in the man who the world will believe is Jesus Christ, the Antichrist. Uh, if we understand the scripture correctly, he is alive today, but he cannot reveal himself until after the church is removed at the rapture and then things are going to begin to happen very, very quickly. And it tells us here that our hearts need to be established with grace. And, and I gave the uh, outrageous example of the man whose faith was established by uh, prohibiting wireframe glasses. And different people have held on to all kinds of things over the years. One of the things that I have striven for as your pastor is to get you to pay attention to what's written down. That is our only protection. This is the only thing that we have. And if we're going to protect ourselves from being carried about with these strange uh, doctrines and diverse doctrines, our hearts need to be established with grace. I mean, how many times, just stop and think about it, I ask the question often, but how many times have you heard something and it sounded right, but you knew something was wrong and you just weren't quite sure what it was? Uh, that is a heart that is established with grace, protecting you from the trickery and the deceit that is out there. No, we don't follow our hearts, amen? And we go back to the scripture and we keep things in the scripture, but our religion is not in things that we can hold in our hands. Uh, we have very few relics in the Baptist church. Uh, in fact, we have no real relics. Uh, someone once said there's enough splinters of the cross uh, to build Noah's Ark and, uh, and enough nails of the cross to hold Noah's Ark together. And, uh, and there's all of these things that people go out there and if you have ever heard of the Shroud of Turin and how that is the image of Christ, it was verified a painting uh, there is no blood cells in the blood stains, but uh, there is uh, uh, red ochre, which is the color that makes the paint 
looked like dried blood and, and was uh, used in those days, we do not hold to seeing our faith established by things that are out there. How many of you remember that time they said they found Noah's Ark and this was going to prove the Bible was correct and then the Turkish government wouldn't give them freedom to go up there and examine and everybody was, oh, wow, if we, if we could only go up there, people would believe. No, people, if they won't accept God's grace and they won't allow their faith to be established by what's written in this book, it doesn't matter what you do, they're not going to believe. So we need to be consistent, we need to be careful, we need to be grounded in the Word of God. And we get to verse 10, and our writer goes on beyond this, and he begins to talk about our altar. The sacrifices that we are saved with are not the sacrifices that were performed by the Levites uh, in the temple. Uh, the idea that those sacrifices saved anyone is not true. The evidence is very full in your Bible. How did Daniel get saved who never offered a sacrifice in his adult life? Daniel did not build an altar in his house to offer sacrifices to God because he wasn't a Levite. He wasn't the temple. It wasn't the right city. What did he do? He opened his windows and he prayed three times a day toward Jerusalem. That's all he could do. But God gave him incredible revelation and insight into things that have happened and one of the criticisms of the book of Daniel is that it's so accurate it could not possibly be prophecy. Uh, I just love that. Uh, God's prophecy is too accurate when in the book of Deuteronomy God said the standard for his prophets was 100% accuracy. Amen? Uh, and so uh, our altar where the sacrifice was made that saved us we don't partake of that altar. We don't get to eat of those sacrifices. And it goes on here and it says the bodies of, uh, 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 I'm sorry, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, let us go therefore, un, therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Now we're digging into new material here that we haven't covered in this study. Um, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament uh, pictures and uh, I've been tempted just to take this one verse and spend our whole evening here, but don't want to do that, want to keep moving here. But you can take everything that happened. The high priest on the Day of Atonement was to put his hands on the sacrifice and confess his sins on the bullock and confess the sins of Israel on the baby goat that was to be offered. Guess what the priest and their servants did to Jesus the night that he was tried. They spit on him. They beat him. If you're going to hit someone, guess what you're doing? You're laying your hands on them. Just like the Bible said, it, it's amazing that they couldn't recognize. And as they were taunting Jesus, you know what they were doing? They were confessing the sins of Israel, the sins of unbelief, the sins of rebellion and hatred toward the very God of Israel. They fulfilled every Bible picture. And the Bible says that what you and I are to do is to be willing to go outside the camp 
bearing his reproach. Now remember, this book was written, it is titled Hebrews. It was written to the Jewish people. And so he was telling those Jewish people who were reading this book, we start in chapter 1 with Jesus being the ultimate revelation of God to mankind. Here in the last chapter, he is telling them that you're going to have to leave the traditions of your fathers, the empty practices of a religion that man conscripted, converted, perverted, changed over. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why the Bible says the Lamb of God uh, who died before the foundation of the earth, before God said, let there be light, all of these things were already fulfilled. This is why even though we believe and talk about dispensationalism, we don't agree with everything the dispensationalists say. Uh, some of them say that Jesus presented the kingdom and as he rode the donkey through Jerusalem, and if only the Jewish people would have accepted him, that would have been the end of all history. And I want to challenge you, that's not possible because the crucifixion and the resurrection and the second coming and the kingdom and all of these things are mentioned in the Old Testament. They were already prophesied. Jesus showed the disciples in that first church service that it behooved Christ, that it was fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus should suffer and die and that he would rise again. And so as we understand this passage here, it is our job to leave the halls of acceptable religion. This is one of the places where many of our younger preachers are, are being destroyed, are stepping out of the truth because they, they're tired of being called ignorant and unlearned. And uh, I know that uh, uh, sometimes... Uh, we as uh, Baptist preachers are not careful with things that we should be careful with and we can appear uh, like we do not know our information. But I'll tell you one thing, there's no excuse for not knowing the Bible. And there's no excuse for leaving what is clearly taught in the Bible. Those out there that are not even saved. We've got to be careful about this. History, all of the teachers, you go to any Christian bookstore and you will find book after book telling you your King James Bible has full of errors and it's not the best and it's not this and it's not that. We reject that. We reject it wholeheartedly. We have Martin Luther coming along and saying that the church of Jesus was so corrupt that God called on him to straighten it out. That's blasphemy. Jesus said the gates of hell should not prevail against his church. Sung Young Moon, talk about dumber than dumb, comes along and says, Jesus appeared and begged me to fix the problems that he left in his church. I mean, how do you get that foolish? Uh... I just stand by my standard. You have to go to school. you got to be trained. Somebody's got to help you be that dumb. It doesn't come natural. Uh, and this is where the world is going. And guess who is pointing the finger at us and saying, you're the people that don't know what's going on is the very people that are changing the doctrines, the very people that are sacrificing truth, the very people that are trying to change Jesus into less than who he is. Guess what? Jesus hasn't changed. We're not going to change. Our, sac our altar, our sacrifice was that that Jesus did on Calvary's cross. And by the way, no one in this auditorium, no one in the history of this church was alive when Jesus paid the price for our sins. Amen? Isn't that astounding? How many of you actually thought about that and said, what is he saying? 
You see, the work is done. We're not trying to redo the work. Here's what it says. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Our sight should be set on the new Jerusalem. I'll tell you, I, 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 uh, I, I believe that I am as patriotic as I can be, uh, but I still cringe when we sing that uh, song talking about thine alabaster city, uh, city's gleam undimmed by human tears. Uh, uh, that's not here, all right? Uh, the, the poet was waxing just a little eloquent there and uh, uh, has stepped far beyond the realm of hyperbole. Uh, but we are looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. That city where no tears will stain those golden streets. That city where the Lamb and God himself is the light thereof. And if we lose track on that, I want to remind you, we need to be careful. You don't want to be on the wrong side of prophecy. And it just may be, as we cannot find America distinctively spoken of in the scriptures, that there may be some cataclysmic things that happen and change Everything we know before the Antichrist can be uh, revealed. And we may be participants in those horrific events. But if our sight is set on the new Jerusalem, guess what? We may have to say goodbye. Uh, I, I cringe sometimes when people sing, God bless America. Because they're not going, please, God, will you bless America? It's almost commanding him. It's almost saying that it is decided that God should bless us. And there's many reasons God's judgment is and should be upon us. Our sight is the new Jerusalem. You know what our duty is? In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. How many of you know that verse is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? But it's what it says here in the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, is it not? By him, Jesus, therefore, because of what he has done and will do, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. This is our hope. This is what keeps us from getting depressed and losing sight of God's goodness and God's grace. We've got to stay here. We've got to remain thankful to God for what he is doing what he has done, and we need to understand the promises, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, that alone should be enough to keep our sights on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? If we stop being thankful, that is the first step to perdition. Now, until Jesus comes, we have a few things to do here. And uh, verse 6, to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. How many of you have ever had an opportunity to do something good, to just help somebody? And it was like, oh no, I got to do this. Listen. To do good. If we have an opportunity to do good, let's be the doer of the good. Amen? Let's be careful 
about our complaining. We take care of that in the previous verse, and it says, uh, and to communicate, forget not. I, I can't explain this. Uh, I remember uh, one Sunday, actually, many years ago, when my wife and I were first married, we had an ice storm in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, ice storms, we'd, you get those in Oklahoma City, and they're there in the morning, and they're gone in the afternoon. Uh, maybe they'll come in in the evening and freeze everything overnight, but by the noon the next day, all the tree branches are broken, power lines are down, and it warms up and it melts and goes away. But I'll tell you, in Cleveland, I mean, the ice was there and it was there to stay. It took them several days to get that thing. And uh, I, I remember uh, I was the bus mechanic at the church and I called up... Uh, the bus director, and I said, what are we doing? He said, we're not running the buses today. And I said, uh, I've got an old uh, clunker of a car. I'm afraid to uh, uh, drive it. He said, no, no, do what's safe and stay home. We got there next Sunday, and uh, Brother Thompson was in fine form. He said, you know, only about a quarter of our church showed up last Sunday. He said, but three quarters of the offering did. And uh, he reminded people that they were to communicate. That's, that's what the word communicate. And I, I want to say something through this COVID thing and everything. Our church is honestly evaluating. We're about down to half our former attendance. But I want to tell you, we're still running 100% of our offerings. So people are communicating. This is good. This is part of our duties. And please, let's, let's keep that testimony up. And let's be faithful. Let's do good. Let's communicate. And what's the next one? It, it says here, these are the sacrifices that God wants us to make. And it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, I, I thank the Lord very, very few occasions over the years have I had to approach someone and say, I, I need you to understand something. I and the pastor of the Open Door Bible Baptist Church. Very few times. And I praise the Lord for that. Because you know what that means? Almost everybody that comes through the doors of this church, 99% and above, say, let's do things the Bible way. And as a pastor, I want to just take this opportunity and say, thank you. Because... I don't. I, I know some churches where uh, the pastor has said, oh, I, "I could never preach a sermon like that to my people; they wouldn't listen." You're very patient. You put up with your preacher, and one of the reasons you do is because what I'm telling you is what's in the Bible, and and we have a commitment together. We have a covenant together as members of this church to serve God, God's way. And I do not take this passage lightly. Uh, when you are reviewed, when he, the Bible tells us in the books of Corinthians that each one of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, it says that our works are going to be tried by fire. In 2 Corinthians, it says that we're going to receive the works rewards of our work, whether it be good or bad. And, and if I understand this passage in the words that are here, uh, when someone who was a member of our church is called into judgment, guess who's going to be there? Pastor. And I'm going to have to give a report. And uh, I will tell you, uh, that is not always going to be a pleasant thing, but the vast majority of the time, amen. It's going to be a good thing. 
and I am preaching to the choir tonight. You are here on Thursday night. We are working together. And so, listen, this is part of our duty. We're to do good. We're to communicate. We're to work together in the context of the local church. And again, this passage here it is one of those things that puts the entire book of Hebrews in the context of the local church. This faith that you have uh, today is to be lived out in the church. It's to be lived out under the authority uh, of the man that God has sent. And then verse 18, pray for us. Now that word us is plural. And, and the writer of Hebrews, most people believe the writer of Hebrews is uh, the Apostle Paul. And, and we'll come up with that information in just a few verses here. But he's, the writer here says, Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. But I beseech you, the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace, now uh, we're going to stop at verse uh, 19 because then he's going to pray, but uh, he's saying, okay, here's your duties. Do good, communicate, be a part of the church that you're a member of and serve God and pray for us. Now, that sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Our ladies meet every Thursday night before church to pray for missionaries. And we pray that God will keep our missionaries, that he will keep them safe, that he will uh, use them and, uh, and bless their ministries. And, and the writer here is saying, listen, we have a good conscience. We're willing to live wherever God puts us right now as we get to the end of this book. Uh, uh, he, the writer is going to say they, uh, the saints in Italy salute you. And so this was written from Italy. And of course, Paul spent time in prison in Italy twice, two different occasions in the book of Acts. He was, uh, uh, though it doesn't record the trial, he would have stood before uh, Caesar. He would have been released. Uh, he was out ministering. He traveled as far as Spain. Uh, other uh, History tells us he went even to Wales and started a church in the British Isles. And uh, then he was arrested again and brought back to Rome. And that's where he would write uh, 2 Timothy. He was awaiting his execution. And he's saying, I'm willing to live wherever God puts me. But my prayer is that I could be restored to you the sooner that I could be back with you, that I would have my freedom. And now the writer begins to pray. And he's going to pray for the reader. And there's, though he's not considering us in actual uh, words as Jesus did his uh, the, praying the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17, if there still is an application for us. And it says, now the God of peace that brought us again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now that's not a very long prayer, is it? But, wow. He says, The God of peace that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, he is praying that God would make you perfect in every good work. Now, what is our number one excuse? Nobody's perfect. Uh, I can't remember who I was talking about. There's a little problem 
that we were coming out with the, with the lights and one light is a few inches out of sync with the other one or the distance isn't. And, and I remember talking with somebody and he said, nobody's going to see that but you. And uh, that's not true. Other people will see it. And uh, listen, the excuse is, well, nobody's perfect. Right? Well, wait a minute. Right here, the writer is praying that God would make them perfect. So let's stop redefining words so that we have an excuse not to do what we're supposed to do. The word perfect simply means complete. Have you accomplished everything that God wants you to accomplish? say, well, how in the world will I know? Well, if you look in the mirror, get real close and go, and if there's a little steam on the mirror, you're still alive, all right? And uh, if you're still alive, God has something for you to do. Amen? Uh, let's try that again. If you're alive, if God has given you life through Jesus Christ, He's got things he wants you to do. You're not finished yet. And so we need to keep doing those work. And to be perfect is just to fulfill God's will for our life. Let's not stand before God and say, well, nobody's perfect. Okay, tell me something that God doesn't already know. Uh, but he wants us to be perfect. He doesn't want us to redefine the words God is not talking about sinless perfection. That's why Jesus died on the cross. Amen. That's why 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. This is in the Bible, but let's strive. Let's keep our eyes on that new Jerusalem. Let's keep our eyes on God who brought Jesus back from the dead, who established the covenant uh, uh, through his everlasting um, sacrifice, through the blood of the everlasting covenant is the words here. Let's ask God to help us to complete the work he's given us, to do his will, that Christ would work in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Now, how's that happen? Through Jesus I remember dealing with a dear lady, I, I don't know. She never gave testimony that she actually trusted Jesus as her Savior. Witnessed to her many, many times. She said, I just can't live that narrow road. It's just, it's just too tight for me. I, I can't do everything I'm supposed to do. And, and, and a, welcome to the human race. None of us are perfect in that sense. We are made perfect in Jesus Christ and any good thing that we do is because Jesus was working in us. We go back to the first verse that we may boldly say, the Lord is our helper and I'm not going to be afraid of what man can do. Amen? Paul's, uh, well, I, I said Paul, but the writer's prayer is to make you perfect in every good work, to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Our purpose, read Revelation chapter 4, the last verse is for his pleasure, is to bring glory to his name. Read the book of Ephesians, that in the ages to come, we can show the exceeding kindness of God to us word. And then the writer says, make uh, verse 20, and I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in a few words. Now, the lesson count here is 33. So we've added to those words more than a few. Amen? Uh, we have spent some time studying this book. 
uh, the last time we went through the book of, uh, of Hebrews, I think it was 78 lessons, uh, about a year and a half. And uh, I, I make no apologies for being shorter this time or being longer that time. Uh, I just want you to know that the writer here says, this is only a little portion. That's why I like to make the connections in the book of Hebrews to all the other scriptures that we can. Uh, if you want an exercise that will help you spiritually, just start in Hebrews chapter 1 and start connecting other scriptures that talk about the same thing. Uh, you, will, you will connect nearly every chapter in the Bible before you're done. Now we get to the final closing words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. This is the main reason most people believe the Apostle Paul wrote the book, that Timothy was his scribe who actually wrote the words. And uh, Paul always had a habit of saying, I've written to you in just a few words, because Paul uh, was truly a Baptist preacher in every sense of the word. He had a lot more to say than what he took time to say. Amen? And uh, so uh, Timothy, he says, is being set at liberty. And if I get my liberty, guess what? I'm coming with him. Salute all them that have the rule over you. So he's talking to the Hebrews in general. He says, you salute the pastors of the church. Then you salute all the saints, and they of Italy salute you. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm going to the meeting next week uh, at Heartland is because I serve on the board, and I'm supposed to be there for the board meetings. Amen? But the reason we have that board and the reason I serve on that board is simply because the leaders of the college understand something. Colleges are not here. In these days, people were trained right in their local churches. But I'd like to challenge you, if we took every dollar we've given to Heartland over the years, and that would be a lot of money. I mean, in anybody's book we would barely have what it takes to educate one or two students. And if I'm honest, we wouldn't do as good a job here as they are able to do there. And so we support the college and we work together because men and women need training for the ministry. One of my statements that I stand by, if you are thinking about the gospel ministry, you must consider attending Heartland Baptist Bible College. It is one of the best schools. It is the best school I know of. That's why I support them. That will train you for the ministry. Heartland is not perfect. Uh, it can't be because it's an organization of men trying and striving but I will tell you this, they, will, they prepare the students that attend there to be servants in their local churches. One of the things I love about Heartland is we get our students back. Uh, other Bible colleges are not like that. Uh, I know one Bible college, uh, I'm not going to tell you the name, but they take the best the cream of the crop, every one of them that they can, and they put them in their ministry right there at home. Uh, well, if Bible college is the end of all things, then that's what you ought to do. But I'll tell you, the greatest and the best graduates of Heartland are out all over the world serving the Lord. That's the way it ought to be. Amen? And we ought to salute the other brethren, we work to get. That's what this is talking about. Preachers, your pastor needs preaching. 
That's why I go to the meeting. And if you want to, please tune into the live stream. Uh, it'll be there on the college website and you can enjoy some of the preaching. And uh, if we could work this thing out to get a bus or something, I, I just don't know how that would ever happen, but uh, I'd love to drive the bus. Um, it, it would be a good time to go, but a lot of logistics and getting everybody there and places to stay and all food and all of these things. Hey, let's, we're, we are saluting the brethren in the fact that our church is giving to help with the college. Amen. And they are saluting us and we have fellowship and our churches work together. And it says here, Grace be with you all. That's the goal. We need God's grace to live each and every day. Amen. That's how you got saved. That's how you live for the Lord. And if we're not living by grace, if we're living on our own efforts, hey, let's get into this book and let's get convicted uh, by God and let's get things straightened out. We, if we're going to serve God, guess what we're going to do? We're going to work with other churches. Think of all the churches that we're connected to through our missionary giving. I would say hundreds of churches. Well, even Heartland, we're connected to over 400 different churches just in that one ministry. And as we serve the Lord, as we communicate, as we remain thankful to God, no matter what goes on in our city, and, and as impossible as it seems, I don't know about you, I could complain about our mayor and our governor uh, several entire sermon periods. I, I could, uh, without even preparing for that message. What good would it do? Other than here you say, yeah, pastor, that, I agree, yes. I mean, we'd have revival. No, we wouldn't. Because we wouldn't be thankful. We got to keep our hearts centered on Jesus. Praise God. New York City is not the end. I'm glad the end is in a city. I think there's a sermon there, don't you? Uh, that God loves cities and he wants us. In fact, he's going to end all Christianity in a city. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I'm not going to preach the sermon tonight, honest. But I want you to think, as we've gone through this book of Hebrews, we have laid down a lot of things, again, that we've gone over before, in years past, but even if you weren't here for that, there, there's nothing new in the book of Hebrews now, is there? But we're supposed to do good, communicate, keep giving, be thankful. We're supposed to work within the authority and the organization of the local church. We're to pray for others serving God. We are to understand that that prayer that the writer of Hebrews wrote, hey, God wants to make us perfect. He wants to use us to his fullest potential. That is our goal. And we get to work with other believers. And then guess what? One of these days, we'll be together in heaven. But until that day, we need the grace of God for each and every day. And all God's people said, amen. And the book of Hebrews is done. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for allowing us to finish this book tonight in our study. Lord, we ask that we would 
that the Holy Spirit would have freedom to reteach these lessons in our heart, in our daily walk with you, that you would keep us in the way which we should go, that your grace would keep us each and every day, that we would never allow that spirit of unthankfulness to creep in, Lord, that we would run that race with patience and that we would stay in that narrow way serving our God through His power and His ability. Lord, help us to be careful to encourage other churches and other ministries. And Lord, we just want to say thank you and praise you for all you've done for us. Lord, we want our testimony to be The Lord is my helper. In Jesus' name we pray. And before we finish that prayer, as we do, we'll give you a moment to add to it on your own. God's people said, let's stand together and let's sing our benediction as we're dismissed. Page 51, take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven, and all God's people said, Amen.